Welcome to another week in the Foyer Reference household and we're starting off with a very exciting patron announcement. Shout outs to Jamie Russell. He is a very learned man of all of the films and all of the teachings. Thank you so much. It really means a lot to have your support and amongst all of our beloved friends and lovers. We also want to lay tribute and honour Earl DMX Simmons, Rest in love and peace and power. We are going to sip on something, reminisce and live a little bit longer in the life and legacy of DMX. Let's get on with the show. Friends and lovers, welcome back to the For Your Reference podcast. You got your host, Katie. And Doty. Steady, are you ready? Hold on to your rot wheel of private and meet me on the steamy couch for sloppy banana eating lessons. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> this week, we navigate the streets and the sheets with the 1998 film, Belly. Woohoo! Woohoo! Woohoo, OT. What a time. What a time indeed. Um, and there is no better time to give people their flowers um, while they're alive and also after. DMX uh, means a lot to the four-year reference household. I think even in the last episode, very many times we reference DMX playfully um, when we talk about a character that is all about rampage and just ready <laughs> to burn all the shit to the ground. And that definitely reflects um, in the film that we're talking about today. Today. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of emotions today, um, be it full on DMX um, or even the more tender moments as well. How are you feeling, OT? Whew. I'm feeling good. I think um, after watching this movie, we had a lot of thoughts, but mm. it was good seeing I'll do his thing yeah. and we just love him. Oh, absolutely. So let's get into just the general sort of stats or information um, in regards to the film. And I think first impressions, we're going to live in that space a little bit more than we usually do. So we have director Hype Williams, who <laughs> we'll get to, we'll get to OT's um, reaction in a second. Hype Williams is also credited as writing as well as Anthony Bodden, as well as Nas, the Nas. The same Nas that was a character in the film, but maybe was just Nas. Yeah, Nostradamus, <laughs> mate. <laughs> this was an extension of the Nostradamus album. <laughs> the universe, the yep. universe. Uh, so we have obviously starring Nas, DMX and Terrell Hicks, as well as a whole slew, including Sean Paul. Mm. Yeah, there was a temperature and it stuck like glue, OT. Woohoo. Who said we couldn't be uh, film and music podcasters, friends and lovers? <laughs> Giving the nil drop a run for his money, eh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it had a budget estimated of $3 million. Mm. Cool. It probably went to all of the blue filters. Does this qualify as a OT blue film? It, it almost does. Okay. <laughs> I think that's in our Noshka episode. OT gives his memories of blue films, if you guys know. If you're learned and you're nasty, you probably know what blue films mean. It's good that you're calling it films, eh? <laughs> Elevating their status. <laughs> if you're fapping with a monocle, it is a film. Ah, all right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> There's some more merch, OT. Uh, a cumulative worldwide gross of $9.6 million. All right. It had a very insular sort of feel. Yeah. Um, it, it, it didn't have the Bayerisms, you know. Mm. It was for a certain audience. Anyone else wants to watch it, cool. But we're here to tell a story. Yeah. And we're here to shoot a movie-long music video, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Williams, come correct. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So let's get into first impressions. I want to live in the world of music and also film um, of DMX. I want to live in there for a little while. So start us off, OT. So when did you first hear of DMX? I'm assuming it was through his music. Was he big in Kenya? Did he have a big influence on your life? Did 
Did you go around barking at other people? How did it all work, my love? So, wow. Um, I think a huge chunk of my childhood was just DMX. Wow. And he was my introduction to sort of rap music. And it's weird because I really was into his sort of stuff. It was the first tape, cassette tape I owned, you know? Wow. <laughs> that, was, that was massive for me. Okay, hang on. Are we saying like official cassette tape or you heard official it on the radio? Official cassette tape, mate. Okay. So I you had weren't a recording. Copy. Okay. <laughs> Because you know what I'm talking about, your little bootleg, like, recording off the radio and replaying it. Yeah, and, and I think that's one of the first albums, even as a kid, that I listened back to back. Mm. And he just had an influence. He had something clicked for me as a kid. And a lot of his stuff, you could tell in his demeanor, personality, that, you know, a lot of this stuff, street level, he was down to earth. And I just fucking connected he mm. was massive he was massive in my class and i think it was just this group we had ours we had rough rider march <laughs> official <laughs> it wasn't official of course but it was still rough rider march it still you know. counts roughy riders doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> just like my fat farm with the reversed peas yeah you know you know it was like wearing a, a, a rough rider 88 football jersey or a Ruffy, a Ruffy Rider 08 jersey, you know? Mm. So did, you do any, did you do any stunts <laughs> on like bikes? We tried to, and that's one of the far, that's one of the reasons why I never even try and ride my bike anymore because I hurt myself really bad trying to be a Rough Rider. You're out of the game now. Oh, definitely out of the game. <laughs> um, we strongly recommend the mini series Rough Riders Chronicles because I don't think up until we watched the mini series that was released in 2020 that they had a full on operation. They had a stunt mm. crew, the director, everyone understood the whole Rough Rider of everything. Yeah. Right. So it was a lifestyle. It was a lifestyle. It really Absolutely. Was, yeah. Um, I was very sheltered as a child and even though I had older brothers that would listen to rap, I got sheltered from a lot of that. Mm. Um, so I do feel like I heard DMX without even knowing it was DMX. But if I want to say consciously, I was introduced to DMX through the masterpiece starring Morris Chestnut and Shad Gregory Moss, otherwise known as Bao Wow. Don't say it. Like Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I was saying we haven't co covered Morris Chestnut on this podcast and maybe Like Mike was the one to do it. I also thought that we could do Like Mike in tribute to DMX, but I'm pretty sure I've got myself in enough trouble. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, but yes, the, the very clean, the cleanest of clean that probably only had 20 words in it, um, Party Up, was uh, on heavy rotation. Oh, uh. Uh, and going back to the mini series of the Rough Rider Chronicles, it was interesting in the way that it contextualized hip hop at a time when Tupac and Biggie were kind of off the scene and rap was kind of becoming a bit more flamboyant. It was a bit more showy. It was about your ice. It was about the grills. It was about, you know, all of the money, the bad boys mm. of it all. Yeah. And DMX was completely in his own lane, still talking about pain and struggle. Um, not to say that bad boys wasn't capable of it but there were definitely different aesthetics it was just a different energy to what bad boy wanted yeah yeah which they do cover um in the mini series as well but yeah dmx is just he just felt like genuine mm. you know um a lot of the time whether visual to other people we're battling our own demons yeah. Um, and DMX made that very clear. Um, you know, the, there were lots of interviews in the miniseries where he, they were talking about him ending concerts with a prayer um, and also getting very emotional. It was more than just a concert. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's it's definitely going to be a spot that is that will be felt that hopefully maybe will never be filled in hip hop. For sure. A hundred percent agree with that. Let's talk about um, other legends in hip hop and the music industry. Let's talk about Hype Williams because when we were deciding um, which film to cover, this was also through Ava DuVernay's tweet talking about how this is one of her favourite films, especially DMX's performance in this. Um, you saw the credit of Hype Williams and it got you hype. 
<laughs> because I, for some reason, I assume there's another Hype Williams out there. <laughs> What's the probability of that? Because right. he was he was massive in the in, in the early noughties. Everything was just Hype Williams. You know, you could tell by the fucking big font <laughs> at the start yeah. of any music video and yeah. at the end. Yeah. So you know, it was weird that I didn't know that Hype Williams had written and directed the movie. So it was mm. definitely just, yeah, we have to watch it. We definitely have to. But it, it was interesting because for me, at least I felt like it wasn't until like the late 2000s where you would see like producers or directors, like Director X is very big um, in regards to music videos right now. Melina Matsukas, go and listen to our Queen and Slim um, episode. She has done a lot of music videos, Formation by Beyonce specifically. Um, so it, it is interesting because I didn't realise that there was that sort of tagging and branding even back then. But you completely <laughs> recognise his name um, as soon as we saw it. I just want to quickly go through um, music videos that he's directed. Feenan by Jodeci, what a time to be alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also have Notorious B.I.G., Warning, Big Papa. We have Brandy sitting in my room. Montel Jordan, This Is How We Do It. One More Chance by B.I.G. again. We have Boys to Men, Vibing, Wu-Tang Clan, a lot of Wu-Tang Clan, Warren G., Outkast, L O Cool J. Also, Hey Lover. Hey Lover is one of my favorite songs. Mm. That is the only reason I will forgive you for leaving me. <laughs> if it's through the storyline and the lyrics um, of Hey Lover, Nas and Lauren Hill, If I Rule the World, LL Cool J again. It just, it goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. And we'll definitely talk about uh, the directing and the cinematography and the choices um, in editing as well. But, it, oh, Nice and Slow by Asha. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Love Like This, Faith Evans. Yeah. We could really be here all day. And that's just the 90s. We haven't even got into the 2000s. But wow, OT. This mm. was a lot of movie. It was. It was, was it was it too much for you to handle or was it just enough? It wasn't too much in the sense that I really wanted to love it. And I went towards it having some sort of tax already applied to it. Because mm -hmm. what's not to love? You know, you've got Nas, you've got DMX, even Hype Williams to some extent. You know, he, he was the fucking basis of whatever the fuck we listened to back then and watched. Yeah. So I had my rose-tinted glasses on already watching this. And mm -hmm. the way it started, you know, I was like, oh, yes, I'm in for some fucking huge... <laughs> Let's let's talk about it because I would say that is one of the best opening scenes I've seen in a long time for a film. Mm. And and maybe it is, you know, harnessing that filmography in regards to music videos because it isn't just a music video. Even back then, there was an artistry to creating music videos if you did it well. Yeah, yeah, 100% great. And I think the fast sort of scene, you already know, like I could tell, Fucking Hype Williams, yes, of course this is going <laughs> to look like this. It made so much sense. I, I absolutely loved it. This is also a time to say spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. And in musical, maybe not film senses, splooshes, splooshes, splooshes. Mm. Um, as we talk about this film. But, you know, there, there's a lot of our frame of reference that we choose to leave at the door when we watch things. And usually that means living in the world of drugs. Yeah. Right. Um, unless you listen to my sentiments in four blocks, uh, for example. <laughs> um, but you know, th there's a lot of crime is bad and we're not going to dispute whether it is inherently bad or systemically bad. Um, but yeah, we see these two guys in a club about to fuck shit up, mm -hmm. right? And on a normal instance, probably not great. In a film, long music video instance, give me all of the nasty. <laughs> give me all of the beautiful bodies. Give me, give me the men and all of their chains beating people up, mm -hmm. right? That's exactly what you want. And it really set the tone of what we were going to get into in the film. Yeah, he did. Visually, it was great. It was tantalizing. I would say, you know, the first 20 to maybe 40 minutes of this film was really good in drawing the suspense. Mm. Something's going to happen. Who's going to drop? Where are we going with this? There was a lot of tension building in, in the first 20 to 40 minutes 
um, of this film and it is bolstered on the foundation of the opening scene of this film. Oh, definitely. It, it really does because we get introduced to the major characters in this. Mm-hmm. You've got Bundy, Sincere and Knowledge, you know, um, mm-hmm. being mentioned in there. And the sort of difference in lifestyles between Bundy and Sincere and what Sincere aspires to be. Yeah. So a lot of this was, especially when you're looking through artists through the lens of the community that they're from Uh and the sort of livelihood that they want to live and what they aspire to and a lot Mm -hmm. of it we're getting through nazi's um sincere's commentary yeah uh, um narration rather and you could tell that a lot of this stuff really did hold dear to how he wanted to live he was like using the notes on his iphone (laughs) <laughs> right what he, what he writes down at 2 a.m and then putting it in the script mm-hmm. let's talk about the storytelling style because it isn't the first time on this podcast where i've talked about narration i can't think of you know if you were to put me into a corner and ask me where has narration actually worked for me i wouldn't be able to answer it generally i'm not really a fan um of narration and i wasn't a fan of narration in this film i don't know i think i've watched a lot of good movies that have used narration well we're talking about this movie though yeah but uh, like you've said that you've not watched a lot of movies that narration didn't really that they didn't use narration properly and i'm saying that i'm countering that with the fact that we covered million dollar baby which had narration at its forefront and i think that did it quite well but i'm saying in this film Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, didn't really care for it in this. <laughs> I was like, when did you become the Narration Coalition? Because <laughs> it starts off, I'm pretty sure DMX is the one that starts the film because he talks about selling his soul to the devil mm. and it was cheap, mm. right? Go and listen to our Passion of the Christ episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then it turns into Nas narrating for the rest of the film so that kind of felt a bit disjointed to me it's only because it's very obvious the voices are different (laughs) so you could tell it wasn't dmx um narrating all of the way through um but yeah i don't think the narration added anything in regards to i don't know moving on stitching the scenes together and whenever he did try some sort of exposition it was very obvious what was happening (laughs) on the screen even though nas has a very poetic way of saying something a very sincere way of saying it we got it like someone got shot we got it we understand yeah i fully agree with that i think part of it in his narration at least even in some of his lines and Mm. delivery i was like is he just trying to expound on his album here? Like a lot of it felt really nice. Like, and it shocked to me when I actually saw that Nas was, was credited as a writer in this because it really does show. Mm. Well, I said it at the start of the film and then I had to remind you that we did yeah, see the I, I, I don't think I paid attention to it. And I was like, Mate, surely Nas had to do yeah. something with this line. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. And um, I definitely want to focus um, on the characters. But before we do that, let's focus on the directing and I guess also the cinematography and the choices in editing um, in regards to this film. How did you generally feel about the directing of this? Because you did make a comment while we were watching this and I, I would hazard to say that you would also share with our beloved friends and lovers. No, halfway through, I had felt exhausted. Mm. I'd felt exhausted because I felt that I needed to fully focus my attention Mm -hmm. to not miss anything. It felt really uncut gems, which I've not felt in ages. Wow. So I felt like a lot of the directing choices made it seem that I needed to concentrate too much. And there was no semblance of serenity between any sort of scene. Mm. Either you have... Uh, the score was it like just non-stop you had music playing in the background wherever whenever sometimes i had to struggle listening and hearing what they had to say and granted we had the ability to have subtitles and we did mm. but it still made me feel it was the edge of my seat stuff not because the story was interesting not that it wasn't but just because i felt like I'd be able, I'd be missing something if I wasn't fully focused. Mm -hmm. And halfway through, I had used up almost all of my juice in concentration. And that's not not really a good thing when 
I want to, I came with this with already tax on it that I was <laughs> eager and excited to watch. You, you've already exhausted your tax quota for the taxation <laughs> financial year. Yeah. That was interesting. The, the fact that you felt the experience that you felt watching Uncut Gems and you felt it here, that is so wild to me. Yeah, because I felt like it was like I needed, I needed a moment of serenity between yeah. scenes. I needed it to calm down a bit. I needed to be able to understand the narrative and the and, and storytelling well, and to sort of build this bond with the characters because it felt like scene to scene to scene, jump to jump, and I was like, well, okay, just. Mate, take me slow. Take me slow. You don't need to ride me that hard. And snap it off. <laughs> Go and listen to our K and Peel episode. Just, 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 you know, foreplay. Foreplay is important. Just take it slow with me and let me build up this connection with the characters. And let me connect with them in a res- in, in, in an environment that doesn't mean me to fully focus on what they're saying, how they're reacting to stuff. Because it was really important, their dialogue. Mm-hmm. Especially when you're putting, you know, when, when you're thinking about the overall community and the environment they're coming from, yep. we had to rewatch a scene with Ox almost five times. I think Be- it was even more than five times because it was a fucking resonating and and deep moment. Because at that time, I'd already spent my my reserve. Like I was I was on the reserve territory, and I couldn't really understand the messaging that he was trying to bring through. Katie had gotten it. She had thought of oh. He was, he was not just talking bullshit. I was like, oh man, I'm already spent. But I think we, you know, friends and lovers, we all come to a point when we're watching a film where there's nothing the film can do to make us care about it any more than we already tried. Mm. Right? Mm. It's like anything you anything you do is already too late because you had your chances and you fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and I definitely want to go back to Ox and, you know, Bundy, because that was quite a deep scene. And I really want to get into um, the detail into that. And I would like to lay flowers many times and especially this time to Regina King and One Night in Miami, because what I'm hearing you saying is that so much was happening, but there were no somber moments where we could digest the scene that just happened and cleanse our palates for what's about to happen. Yeah. Like it felt party up throughout, you know, uh, DMX. Yeah. <laughs> just, just give me some somber moments. Give me some ser- scenes where serenity might prevail a bit, where I can mm. get to digest what just happened, where I can get to explore the world better, where I can get to reason it with the characters and have some sort of emotional connection because it was just from, bam 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 you know if you're not talking about bandy you're talking about uh, sincere if you're not talking yeah. about sincere it's kenya and tia and keisha and method man it was just so much i was like mate mate you've got something here at the core i don't know about you but i can take all of method man i'm just <laughs> <laughs> that's you love what i'm cheese i know that <laughs> i do love my cheese <laughs> Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. The, it was fitting a lot of stuff in, but not letting a lot of it resonate. You know, for our, you know, office drone um, friends and lovers that can relate, it's like constantly having meetings and having no time to action the action items. Yeah. It just kept going. Or having a really good bottle of red wine and not using the decanter. You know, like shit needs to breathe. Why do you have to? <laughs> why do you have to give more evidence that we're wankers, OT? <laughs> I'm going to submit Method Man whatever role he's in next to mm. say wine without a decanter. <laughs> Good. Shout outs to being Mary Jane with Gabrielle Union because I'm pretty sure there was a guy that was angrily pouring into a wine decanter. Yeah. <laughs> you think we don't have BET reference, friends and lovers? You are fucking wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, I absolutely agree. I want to talk now quickly about the editing in this film. There was a lot of like blue overlay and I thought they were using it for a particular effect, but they kind of used it everywhere. A very quick example was with Keisha when she was in the bed. Actually, I think every time she was in the bed, it was like a blue light, but not like a UV light. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But they had like that blue light on it. It kind of reminded me of Tony Braxton's Be a Man About It. Mm. Because it had that sort of aesthetic. But anyway, I'll just leave my Tony Braxton's to myself. Um, 
And then we also had some more longer scenes with that whole blue filter on it. And it was when they were driving through Omaha. Yeah. Yeah. Like there was different sort of coloring throughout the movie and some of it, Man, it just made it hard to see, to be honest. Like, <laughs> like I couldn't even tell who knowledge was until they like shot him clearly uh, uh, midway through the movie. Like I was like, oh, is that fucking knowledge? Is is, is that the other character? There's so many things happening, yeah, and different coloring and different sort of way of presenting this information. I was like, mate, just easy, easy, you know. We've already come out of music video mode. Let's just <laughs> come down a bit with that. Um, but I think some of it, uh, towards the end or the final half of the movie, we'd already stopped using the blue coloring. I think we didn't see that much afterwards, mm. which is good because yeah, I really didn't care for it. There was also some orange tinge overlay. Like, mate, just easy man (laughs) it was it was a lot um one other note i have in regards to the editing was when bundy goes to meet ox for the first time i want to talk about it from a scene point of view but just specifically in regards to the editing it got to a point where they overlaid the football game while Ox was talking and he had a particular vernacular to him. So we were trying to focus on what he was saying because they're having a full on conversation and then they fucking put the football match over it at the same time. Like, what, what importance does the football match hold over this conversation we are having at the moment? I need to speak to the Safty brothers of Uncut Gems because I feel like they took a lot of <laughs> inspiration from that particular scene. Yeah, that was weird, I think we were already struggling. And I think if you went to watch this in the cinema, yeah. a lot of that conversation would just be over your head. Like They, you should, they should do a double billing of Tenet and Billy and see how much <laughs> you can actually understand without subtitles. You think Chris Nolan is a wanker? <laughs> I feel like everyone calls him Christopher, but okay. Oh, mate, we've moved into that other face. You, you know? have your Illuminati, <laughs> Illuminati. <laughs> Yeah, but the the editing um, was a very interesting uh, choice in this film. I kind of got over the fact that it's Hype Williams and he does a lot of music videos, but I think it's also because that didn't stick with me as a kid, so I wasn't even aware of that. I think, do do you think that was part of why you couldn't shake it or you think it was just so distracting? No, I don't know. Like, it's an important conversation and then we have football match going out in the background, being joined in, and then there's this, overlay effect where you see Hype Williams and the video and the football playing on um, soccer being played in the background. I'm like, mm. oh, <laughs> those are some effects that are not really needed here. There was a lot of decision. There yeah. was a lot of decision that was being made. And even, even Ox has this really strong accent, granted, but let us focus on that because that was an important storyline. Mm. That was an important moment for the movie. Yeah. So for us to be drowned out by um, football match just did not make sense. Yeah. Did not make sense. Yeah. And before we go to uh, the writing, I do want to talk about one like director sort of choice that I actually agreed with and also the editing. And it was very early in the film where we have Bundy and Keisha and Sincere and Tion having sex and it's like interspersing their sex. Mm-hmm. And I just made a note that said, the art of making love and fucking. Because <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be in both situations, but they were very, very different. Yeah, they are different. They are different. And when it comes to the writing, I think a little bit of it was not to be harsh or anything like that. I think the messaging was there if you paid too close attention, which exhausted me, but the writing felt a bit off because when you, you'd have one scene mm-hmm. that let's say um, Sincere would say one thing, yep. you know, uh, I'm with you, Bundy, through life and death or whatever, I'm mm-hmm. with you. And then the next scene, you'd have Sincere saying, um, I thought I told you not to call me no more. When did this happen? And that's also an editing thing to make sure the story is cohesive, right? Yeah, mate. Like... 
why are we jumping to this? Are we supposed to assume that this conversation happened off screen? Because I don't think we're picky people. We're not the motherfuckers that, um, you know, get annoyed at Starbucks cups in Game then, of Thrones. Because then if you're using narration as a tool, that's where narration should have come in. Yeah. That's why you use narration to give us that exposition because we didn't know what the fuck happened in between. Yeah, because I I had assumed because of that that in the earlier scenes when Sincere was helping him skip town with the car, I thought he had said something like, oh, we're done here. And you're like, no, that never happened. Yeah, because it didn't. And if that was to, you know, you're getting this really hot and cold sort of emotions from mm-hmm. your two main characters, then we need to understand why that is. Yeah. And then at the end of that conversation, we still get them being boys. Was it a joke? Was it, I really didn't understand that aspect of it mm-hmm. and why they chose to do it that way. Yeah. I, I, I just have um, something I want to say in regards to the writing generally, and then we can get into some characters. Yeah. Mm. Um. I guess it's not just writing, but generally I know this came out in 1998, but I have to come from the fact that I just watched this in 2021. Um, Stories about getting rich off of being involved in the drug game is not new. Yep. Right. Films where you have rappers involved in the production and maybe even starring in it is not new. No. And I feel like even at that time, it wasn't new either. No. Nope. Because we talked about Juice earlier as well. I feel like it could have been better. I definitely feel like it could have been better. You know, a lot of the time we talk about authenticity and making sure the people that have the experiences and have stories to tell are able to tell the stories, yeah? Mm. You don't want it to be diluted by people not knowing what they're talking about, right? So there's that part of it. But then there's also you've got the experience of living it or the periphery sort of experience. However... This is a film. Like I said in our Passions of the Christ episode, and thank you for our friends and lovers that have downloaded it, you need to have a story. There needs to be a a complication in regards to the protagonist. We need to go through some learning journey through or a non-learning journey through the protagonist, and we need to have a satisfying payoff, Mm. right? And from a writing point of view, I didn't really feel that. Sexually, it was like OT was in the corner rubbing himself out and I was watching. Like I was not I was not participating. I could see something was happening, but th- there was no way that I could care or resonate about these characters cuz the it was just happening in the room where it happened. Sorry Lynn Manuel Miranda that I had to make your reference in a masturbation, but there you go. <laughs> and it's weird like you know we've talked about movies this year that we had we had this sort of really super intimate moments with characters mm. uh be that in malcolm and marie where it felt like we're eavesdropping to this it just felt like we from the outside looking in yeah. where we really didn't have any connection to either bandy or sincere we know what they were going through but did you really care about either of them no not really but in the context of the storytelling and what they simple symbolized in society and in the environment then maybe yes but that's later in the movie that's not yeah. even now you know mm-hmm. that's the last tax that's the fourth act right you know yeah. like you're not getting it now mm-hmm. and to that point i'm like cool you should have done this. You should have layered this in a different way because you had something at the core of this movie yeah. where we're sitting at the underbelly of the fucking beast. We know how things work. We are uh-huh. trying to have this exposition around it and how it means for those characters particularly. Yeah. And their struggle to either be right or how they get turned into um, seeing the effects of the, their actions as made to society. Mm-hmm. You know, there's really important messaging. But at the end of it, like you've said, it's a fucking movie. Yeah. You know? We uh, need to have a, we need to be succinct in resonation. Yeah. You know, at the end of it, you need to have a, a Russell Crowe sort of Im- imagination in your mind just screaming, Are you not entertained? <laughs> Oh, I thought you were going to say, <laughs> fuck you, cancer. <laughs> <All that. laughs> I, absolutely, I absolutely agree with you. And let's talk about 
the dynamic that was set up at the start of the film. We have Bundy and we have Sincere. As much as they are boys, they are very different in nature and what motivates them as characters. That was very, like those were the grappling hooks in regards to the film. And that's kind of where it frayed as well. It's like a double-edged sword, yeah? And I couldn't help but think of similar dynamics and continue to disappoint me when it didn't deliver, Mm. right? We're talking about Avon and Stringer in regards to The Wire. We have an episode on that. We're talking about Ghost and Tommy of Power. We also have an episode on that as well. Mm. We talk about Franklin and Leon in regards to Snowfall. We also have an episode of that. We're also talking about Abbas and Ali Tony Hamadi from Four Blocks. We also have an episode on that. Like this, again, it's not new to tell stories about the drug game, but also at the same time, it can be done in a way that is satisfying to the viewer. Yeah. Yeah. In a way that you, you get bought into the character's way of life. You empathize, if not sympathize. and Or you can hate them. Like you just yeah, want to watch their yeah, downfall. Yeah. yeah. But, but neither of those rang true, mm. you know. And at the end of it, I'm sitting there at the movie thinking, why save it for last? Yeah. Why save all that payoff for last? It didn't make sense to me. Mm-hmm. And... A lot of the times I was like having this eye rolling moments because if you're familiar with Nas's work, then you're like, yeah, mate, I know you wrote this line. Come on now. (laughs) (laughs) It might not be to someone else who's watching it, but I was like, cool, you know, you've gotten your messaging in there. But to what degree is it distracting or taking away from the movie? Mm -hmm. (sighs) But that like that dynamic was so muy caliente. And if we're just talking about delicious dynamics Judas and the Black Messiah we also have an episode you're welcome um where we talk about Chairman Fred Hampton and Bill O'Neill that kind of fizzled as well Mm. no spoilers we're not going to get into it but anyway disappointing but you have the setup of dynamics right yeah that you're like oh I wonder what sort of hijinks they're going to get into and it just fucking fizzles Mm. And I feel like that's kind of what this film did. But let's focus on Bundy specifically as a character. He is super rough. You can tell that his life has been through the ringer. Mm -hmm. You can see that he is in a place, at least mentally, where he doesn't give a shit about anything else other than getting that paper. You know, we had this exposition with uh, Ox, when they're having a Mm -hmm. conversation and he was like really exposing himself and who he was as a character. And I think that's one of the first times you got to see that. Can we also clarify, because this was him trying to get a connect, trying to get a plug, right? He offered nothing. He walked into this 40 house mansion and offered nothing to Ox. Excuse me. But I would think that he should have like offered something, even though Ox has everything. And he's super, super rich. I, I don't know. It, like They're from definitely a story- no freebies. They're definitely no freebies. It's more that he would get uh, commissions, probably. A cut well, of every... Well, he had it hanging over his head later, which we see. Yeah. Right? But I'm saying usually you have to... Like, there, there's an order to things. There's a certain sort of respect. I watch Sopranos. <laughs> I understand how this works. Like, you need to come in with something. The fact that you're inconvenience him trying to watch his game that is being glazed over our eyes at the same time, it just felt weird to me. But then again, I don't know anything, right? So maybe that is the way you do it. You just walk into someone's house and say, hey, c- give me your connect. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, either way, we do get to see what he stands for. Even in his conversations with Sincere, he says... Life is about that paper. You, 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 you're born to die. Everything in between is that paper. You know, that's his mentality throughout. Ain't no money like dope money. Mm-hmm. And you could tell that he doesn't really care. Even when they're having dinner, sort of the ending of the movie, where uh, there's two... Um, where the, there's two, two the two young kids, so yeah. Lekid and Wise. Yeah. yeah, like he was there, gave the nod of the guy to shoot him. Like, <laughs> just like, the guy was off it. He doesn't care. Well, let's talk about that because if we're talking about character construction, that's kind of where the ass fell out 
right? Because from the start, we meet Bundy and he is all about survival. Mm. Yeah, he's ambitious, so he will go to Ox and get the connect, but also at the same time, he's all about survival, even to the point, but I don't think he cared about Keisha that much. He like ran off and let her get arrested. (laughs) <laughs> and then he went on the run, right? Mm. He he jumped through so many hoops. He backflipped into so many stolen cars where he's like, nah, not me, man. Mm. Not me, bruv. Not today. And I, I think even a line that he had earlier in the film was, if I go back to jail again, I'm going into a bag. Yeah, yeah I'm not going back to jail at all. Yeah, for sure. He said that. And, and then that, he just gave up. Yeah, yeah. Maybe... And that's why, like, where does my tax come in? Because at that, <laughs> at that stage, he's exhausted by everything that has to. He's gone through. They did a flash, a flashback of every sort of moment he's been through to the mm. movie, where every people, a lot of people have died. You know, he's looking at the bodies, and then he's looking at his sort of minion there, just lying dead. And maybe he's like, "Man, fuck this! I've I've had enough." Really. But it wasn't properly told, and that's the issue, right? <laughs> but I, that's what I was saying. This could have been a really meaty moment in the film where we have some sort of payoff, not emotional, because we've already established there was no avatar emotional tentacles in this. But yeah, like that could have been a payoff for this character if it had been written so. But that's why I'm telling you, like, I don't know where my tax should be put because I understood what he was trying to, what Hap and Nas were trying to do in this. I understood it. Oh, wow. You've but, stepped out of the box. You've crossed the fourth wall now. Yeah, I understood it and I looked at it, but it wasn't executed properly. Yeah. And to that, I'm, I, I'm here feeling confused at the end of it because... You you rarely get a hip hop urban <laughs> <laughs> movie like this, which tells such a an intriguing aspect to the sort of drug life and how it means to society and how everything about uplift, uplifting black people. You rarely get that. Mm. It wasn't just about titties and ass. It was it was bigger than that. And I'm sitting here thinking, how do I weigh those two? Yeah. My understanding of what they wanted to deliver, knowing that they didn't really fully do that, mm. or is it because I got it, then they did it. And those two should be married up and be like at the end of it, oh, if the message is delivered across to me and I understood what they wanted to do, mm. then, oh, then this is an eight movie because I got it. Uh. Where does that line get crossed? Yeah, I know. I I completely agree. Um, you know, TV shows. We I, I would say personally, I love TV shows more than I could name any sort of films. Um, but also at the same time, you get more time with characters in TV as opposed to film. Mm. But what that means is it's a different it's a different game plan. Yeah, it's a different blueprint because you need to make us care so we can follow along on these adventures, whether it's like loving or hating them, but the hooks weren't in. Mm. And I think that's part of the problem. But I guess ending on a positive note in regards to Bundy's character, DMX, I wouldn't say it's a prosthetic just for respect. (laughs) (laughs) Respectfully. Oh, yeah, respectfully. <laughs> um, yeah, there's, there's a reason why his character was Tommy Buns Bundy. Yup. <laughs> like Tripod from Beasts of No Nation. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to Sincere. I, I feel like it seemed like Sincere was the character you had the most problems with. And the fact that you kept saying Nas, maybe that's part of the problem because you couldn't, it was literally, it just felt like Nas to you. Exactly. It felt like <laughs> Nas playing himself. But doesn't and 50 Cent just feel like 50 Cent? He doesn't. Except when he has glasses. <laughs> but 50 Cent, he, you know, he gets a lot of slack, but he, he 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 tries, man. It's not like you're watching Power and watching Kanan and thinking that that's 50 Cent because you don't. Kind of. Uh, Aside from the fact that he's not tweeting about Ja Rule, then I would have thought it was 50 Cent. <laughs> but when you're, looking at, when you're looking at the lines that Sincere delivers, huh. it, it felt... It, I, I couldn't distinguish between who Sincere was and who Nas was. Let's digress for a second. 
when you see musical artists, because I actually really enjoy Mary J. Blige's performance in Power Book 2. Mm. So I feel like Mary J. Blige is a pretty good actor. Who else do you feel like when you see like a musical artist, when you see them acting, you can't separate it? Mr. Singing on the Bus, Tyrese Gibson. Do you just see Tyrese or do you kind of see him as Jody from Baby Boy, whatever he was with Joshua Mel in Transformers? Like, are you able to separate the musical artist from the acting? Yeah. Yeah. And if, I don't even need to go far to see Method Man separates himself as well. Oh, Method Man is a sovereign nation. How <laughs> dare you? <laughs> like it's not, but with Nas, it just felt, I'm watching Nas. Yeah. Like I'm watching a behind of scenes Nas when he's trying to write his his his, his album. Like mm. I don't know, and, and a lot of his messaging, you know, altruistic as it was, resonating as it was. <laughs> he he brought this energy of always feeling that he had to be better. He had to do something bigger than who he was as a person. Mm. And he reads this book that blows up his mind yeah. that he feels that he's been living life wrong. Mm. I think it was self-improvement or something. Yeah. And, and I think that was before they had wankery titles of finding my inner self. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. And, and to that degree, you know, he keeps on speaking about what's right, what's wrong, but he's still fucking in the game. He's still benefiting, yes, correct. He's still benefiting. Correct. You could get to see him and, and Tioni living life. You know, they're not really broke. They're all right in, a, in, a, in an okay house. You know, mm. they don't need to do all this other bullshit. They were in a more than okay house. Yeah. That was upper middle class. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. But we know that. See, this is your classism coming again, <laughs> OT. <laughs> it was an all right house. Okay, now. But we know that Sincere wants what Bundy has. What did you feel? Um, welcome, new friends and lovers. Usually we do address uh, first time listeners. And if this is your first time listening to the For Your Reference podcast, The Belly Film, please let us know. Um, but for those that aren't aware, OT is Kenyan. How did you feel about Nas's statement? Let's go back to the motherland. Let's go back to Africa. <laughs> Good for him, man. <laughs> Good for him. He had a baby called Kenya, so I am not. I am <laughs> not holding any grudges. I thought you said you had no more taxes. I forgot about that aspect, so I've just added okay. a little bit more tax. Okay, I think is. <laughs> I think in the future sequel, um, they would be heading to Acon City. Yes, uh, but you could tell that he wants this connection and resonance mm -hmm. that he doesn't currently feel where he was and he feels that the only way he can get that life was to go back to Africa. Mm. And he talks about it being even at the end that he had this connection, he felt at peace and at home and we imagine that he's already there. Yeah, And I'm like, cool, you know, you got your way out. You got your way out and you moved your family away from all that. Uh-huh. And go for him. But when he was still talking about that shit and he was still slinging and he was still doing the yeah. drug things, I'm like, you have to make a choice. Yeah. You know, it, it, even if it wasn't clear to us exactly, and maybe that's a writing thing because one minute he's angry or he's not, he's not riding with, with Bundy the next second he is, you know, it was flip floppy. And I really yeah. didn't know where to stand with sincere because to me, he really wasn't sincere. It <gasps> felt a juxtaposition. <laughs> is this, is this insincere produced, insincere produced and written by Issa Rae? Yup. I'm in. No, but could you tell could you tell me that he was sincere with himself? I think he because they also talked about, you know, earlier in the film, I think his character's name was Black. Mm. And knowledge was the one that dropped knowledge on Bundy and said he was actually going to go for sincere. Like he was going to stick it to him, I think was the word. Yeah. Right. So he was actually going to kill Sincere that night. And it's like, that's where knowledge fucked up because the next moment you see Bundy leaping over the table with the money that stayed stuck to the table. <laughs> Glued on the table. <laughs> <laughs> but 
you see that moment and they, I think they also refer to him as a PhD fucking dickhead or something like that. <laughs> So I don't know, like, you know, there's there's always that that person in your group that is smarter and you know they're going to go on to bigger and better things. Go and listen to our Alice in Borderland episode with Arisu and Karube mm. because that's very similar as well, right? But um, I, I feel like Sincere was he was elevated to another dimension. Like he wasn't living in the reality that Bundy was living. Fair enough. You don't want to be in the streets 24 seven, but at the same time, this is where your riches come from, sir. Yeah. So it's kind of your obligation when Bundy calls you from jail to help. <laughs> true. True. Shout outs to Hassan Johnson, our wee bay from the wire. Mm. Mark. Yeah. You also said while we were watching the film that he's more of a real one than Bundy is. Because <laughs> you see the way he was trying to evade arrest. Well, he's living up to what Bundy was saying. True. He was like, I'll never be caught. Yeah. I'd rather die than be caught or go back to prison. And he meant it. He meant it. He was like, oh, mate. <laughs> Mark my word. Yeah, even though he got up in his car and just tried to drive off, he never gave up. We see Mark play this character over and over again. Loyal. Mm-hmm. Loyal to IC. Um, let's talk about knowledge for a second. Yeah. You know, there were many moments, particularly during the most heated sort of moments, where Bundy just told knowledge to pretty much fuck off. Yeah, which is, you know, like, Bundy didn't care. He didn't care about all that shit. Self, but self-preservation also exactly, includes like, being smart. Exactly. And, and to a point where even knowledge, I'm like, how do you threaten Bundy like that out in the open? Like, come bail me out or else I'll fucking snitch. Who says that? Yeah, it's interesting. And Knowledge also had suspicions that their phones were being tapped, yet he still called Tion and Bundy. And that's what I'm telling you. Like, the names are just, uh, in Swahili, we call it Majazi. It's a juxtaposition mm. of who they are as characters. We have Sincere, uh. who I think is fucking insincere, and Knowledge, who's fucking dumb. Oh my, did you just drop some East African knowledge on these motherfuckers? Booyah, yep. Wow, boom by eh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't think there's much to say about knowledge other than that. But also, actually, just thinking about it while we're talking, Bundy wasn't much different to knowledge because the narration of knowledge was that he was a sloppy motherfucker and he didn't have any regard for anything. But that could also be for Bundy too. Yes, agreed. Um, I would say my favorite character of this film is Tion. Mm. It was nice to see T Boz in a film. I don't know if there was a whole string of films that TLC um was in. Um, yeah, pretty much everything she said, I was like, agree, hundred percent, subscribe, notifications all the way. Um, there are two resonating quotes that I just want to mention. Some people accept the bad and are cool with it. And this is when she's talking to Keisha about Bundy. Mm. That's very interesting because she she makes no illusions about anything. And I think part of the thing that was frustrating me and also frustrating Tion is Keisha kept saying, when is Bundy going to be like sincere? Yeah. And you obviously don't know Bundy because that's him. Mm. That's who he is. And that's exactly what Tion was saying. Some people accept the bad and that's cool. They're cool with it. Yeah. Right. And I don't know, I've ladies, everyone else that identifies don't stick around with someone hoping they're going to change. Exactly. And if you do, that resentment belongs to you. Take Mm -hmm. that baggage, check in that baggage because that is yours. For sure. Um, And then also something else that she said to Keisha is I'm happy with sincere because I'm happy. Mm -hmm. Can we get a fucking amen up in here? Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Since when do you ever do what I ask you, sir? Uh, trying to land the ropes. <laughs> but yeah, um, I absolutely love Tion. I think she was a solid character. She was probably the best character in. No, she is the best character in there. Mm. All right, friends and lovers, I want to end with the scene that OT satiated um, and also call back to. So this is when Ox calls him out that we're going to go to Jamaica. He made it sound like a holiday, but he also said he was going to reap what he sowed. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so you know something was going to happen. Yeah. Right. Um, but it all everything always happens when Sean Paul is around. Let's be mm. fair, friends and lovers. And it kind of becomes, I would say the essential premise of him taking Bundy to Jamaica was to become a hitman. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. He was having a problem with someone. But in any case, what I want to focus on is the car scene while they're going to their destination after landing in Jamaica. Yep. And it, essentially the sentiments of what Ox is saying is that Kingston is a ghetto, not a slum. Mm -hmm. Now, let me say what I took from that scene because I was a fucking archaeologist up in that shit. Mm -hmm. I took all of the meaning. I got as deep as the excavation could let me. All right. I saw this as Ox talking about his inner conflict mm -hmm. of all of the successes that he has. When he says a man can live and be rich in America. He was talking about himself. Mm -hmm. But he also said, I feel for these people, mm -hmm. right? So when he says it's a ghetto, not a slum, from what I infer into that is Ox is saying there is potential for Kingston to become what it should become in its own glory, self-sustainable. Also, I'm not too naive to the fact that he is branded as cutting people's throats and being really heartless and ruthless. And that's how he got to his riches. Yeah. yeah. So I make no allusion to it. Maybe he wasn't as extravagant as Pablo Escobar with his exotic zoos and the hippos that are still there, by the way. Mm. But I also acknowledge, at least in that moment, I like to give credence to vulnerability right it's like saying rich people don't have problems i feel genuinely that ox felt a way on the way that his people were living the way his people were struggling because he said he was in a sea where not many survive so he got out of it and now he's trying to help and that is the depth friends and lovers that you will not hear from my beloved ot <laughs> <laughs> well I understood what you said mm -hmm. and I still don't agree fully. I think he's fucking capable of the environment that is in Kingston or where he was from. Mm -hmm. He is culpable for everything that has transpired there because yes. he fucking kills without any fucking reason. Mm -hmm. He keeps on saying that throughout the whole movie. Yeah. If you care about your people and there's only way he was ever going to get to the top in that in that in that in that city and he stood on top of fucking dead bodies and now he's coming to me telling me he fucking cares mm -hmm. he could piss right off we've had enough of that nonsense in africa but he was where you get people dictators talk about how they fucking care whilst killing their own people so where do you draw the line of oh you say this in public, but yet what you do is completely against the community that you want so to uphold. Mm. Where do you draw the line? Because I'm not buying that. I'm not drinking that Kool-Aid because I've seen those characters way too much in my life. And I don't fucking care that he, he, he feels that he just made it off and he's in America now as a rich man. Because he still boasts of who he is as a character, mm. being that he doesn't fucking care of of life he doesn't take it sacredly at all because he can take it on a whim for fun yeah so don't come to me saying that you fucking care when your actions depict something different i'm not buying it i'm not here to even say that you're that character like you might think that but in reality that's so factual so get out of fucking town because i am not buying <laughs> i am not drinking and you can you know what that scene where he fucking dies yeah I was like, mate, <laughs> <laughs> you fucking deserve that shit. Even if it's a fucking lift up from Scarface, I don't care. <laughs> what? What happened to your tax? What if Ox had a daughter that was named Kenya? Maybe I would have been more understanding. <laughs> <laughs> That's my 60 minute journalism, friends and lovers. But the moment you bring it into reality and you talk about African dictators, obviously there's nowhere for me to go, my love. No, I agree. I'm just saying, painting his sentimental bullshit with a, without brush that he cares, mm. that he actually cares. I didn't say that he cares. I said that it's possible, possible 
that a person like him can have a moment of vulnerability. That's it's, what I said. At that point, it's just self-indulgent in my opinion. All right. <laughs> I, I don't agree. And I think this leads us to the best moment of the movie. Woo! Wait, all gets tied into a bow. Oh, and I love it gets those. gifted to us. Mm-hmm. I'm being told that this is where everything we've done so far mm-hmm. ended up with. You know, and that's when they introduced the minister, albeit out of fucking nowhere. Yeah. We still got to see a scene with the minister and Bundy mm-hmm. and that dialogue. Then you get to understand everything. You get to understand the problems, the issues, the nuances. But my cup dryeth over. Like you said earlier, you didn't care at that point. This was way at the end. So any any sort of bonuses I could have given to this film was already dried up, my love. But at least he spat as lubricant on us. There was a famine in my <laughs> sploosh places. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I, 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 I can forgive a lot. But at that moment, we get to see the intention of the movie. We mm-hmm. get to see everything laid out. At the end, which again, we talked about writing. And then you think of the moments, maybe you have a, you, you'd you missed. Then you see, ah, oh, so that's what they meant. Oh, so that's what they were going for. Then I'm like sitting here thinking, was the execution done properly if this is what <laughs> is meant to make well, that, the whole thing make sense? Well, that's the point. Whether it's exposition, whether it it could be exposition through narration, but whether it's characters, narration, um, visual cues, it should reinforce everything to the crescendo, which is what we're talking about now. Yeah, and then it makes sense to see Bandy give himself up. Mm. To see Bandy doing this for the feds or whatever in trying to kill the minister because... Bill O'Neill. <laughs> he's lost. He felt like he had nowhere to go, but yeah. there was someone there with the answers that he was looking for, for the questions he didn't know that he was he even asked himself. Mm. So he was peeling up layers that... Chakras. ...that Bandy wasn't even aware of. Mm. And then we get to see that connection and that a resonance in Bundy and him just understanding and getting that hug at the end. Yeah. And I'm sitting here thinking, that's fucking powerful. Mm. That's powerful. You know, elevating your people. Yeah. Elevating black women. Yes. Stop killing. Stop doing this shit to yourself. Yeah. And that made sense to me because, because you're thinking about Ox where he had the sentiment that he was doing something for the community while trampling he's over, trampling yeah. over them. And, and this is what it gets all laid out to for him. You know, Bandy was never going to read a book. He was never going to pick that book that he was reading because he said, I'm not all about that. And this was the only way for him to connect and for him to, and that's the only moment we get to see actually Bandy having some sort of emotion in this. Yeah. And I'm like, where was this the whole movie? Yeah. Where was this the whole movie? It made me angry because if you, if they had the chops to write that, they yeah. had the chops to do it throughout the whole movie. Yeah. Oh, man. But we still love Ava DuVernay. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what to do with her. Yeah, Because at the end of it, I was so conflicted. Yeah. I was so conflicted. Mm. Huh. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, let's finish off with final thoughts. We need a John Wick spin-off with Method Man. Uh, Let's talk about it. Who else can take a, a shotgun into the chest and still walk out of there and terrorize and, other people? And he also <laughs> got quaaluded. Yeah. Oh. Hey, yeah. <laughs> Mate, he, he, it's like his killer from Hunter Hunter. He did not feel any effects of poison. What's that? What's fucking quaaludes, mate? Excuse me. Excuse me, urban host. Did you make an anime reference? Of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do want to see. So I've, I'm adding to my list of um, John Wick Universe spinoffs. Mm. And obviously Halle Berry, um, Colin Firth. Go and listen to our Pride and Prejudice episode for more context. And Method Man. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I just love seeing Method Man. Can I just say? Yeah, you've said that a lot. Well, I'm just... <laughs> the, I guess the biggest disappointment I had in the Wu-Tang uh, saga was that he didn't play himself. Mm-hmm. 
I would watch him play himself. <laughs> Just put a gray hair on him to distinguish when he's older. Chiwetel. <laughs> we love Chiwetel Ejiofor. Yeah, I think that was behind blue eyes or behind the eyes. Behind blue eyes is a Creed song, is it not? <laughs> not Creed. <laughs> Mate, that's Limp Biscuit. I would be embarrassed if I admitted that I listened to Limp Biscuit. <laughs> uh, fair enough. I think it was behind her eyes. Yeah, something like that. It was it was an enjoyable movie. It was enjoyable. With Nicole Kidman as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're film podcasters, if you haven't realized, friends and lovers. Is there anything else you want to add to this film, OT? Well, actually, would you recommend... We don't usually do this, but would you recommend people watch this movie? I would recommend people to watch this uh, just for the messaging. I think it's important, especially for when you go and see hip-hop artists as the stars and you think this movie is just going to be low barrel shit. It's not. Mm. And for that reason, you should watch it. You should. And, and take out, take away anything that you want to take away from it. But at the end of the day, they had a message and something that we don't speak of often enough. And especially coming from them, like, geez, man, like everyone should watch this just to have it as in your portfolio that, you know what? I watched Belle. Um, okay, Kelle and my unborn Bebe. Mm-hmm. That's a South Park reference. Interesting you said that. It's like you completely erased what you said this whole episode. <laughs> <laughs> take take the criticisms. Uh, you know, of course we'd have it. it. It's part of our watching experience. It's part of us discussing the movie. But at the end of the day, as a fan as a fan of watching movies and generally just enjoying shit, Mm -hmm. you take something away from this movie that you didn't think that you would. It surprised us. And this is not the first surprise we've had over the, you know, of our sort of movie watching experiences where we gave shit that we didn't know what it was about, but then ended up at the end being super excited about. So definitely, yeah, watch it, man. All right, that is a full-on rubber OT stamp approval. Mm-hmm. Let's finish off in a segment we call For Your Reference, OT. You know what I'm going to reference? It's going to sound a bit off-field, left-field, but I'm going to reference The Shy. The first oh. two seasons sort of touch on the topics that this movie tries to. And by God damn, it was a good two seasons. Well, you better strap on, OT. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of uh, loving <laughs> um, in that show, we also have an episode on the shy. Mm-hmm. You are learning very quickly, OT. I've got two references. All right. I will reference the choir. We have almost four hours um, of podcast content <laughs> in regards to the wire. That's how much we love the choir. And my second reference, OT, mm. is the German series Four Blocks. Ooh. I'm going to keep referencing Four Blocks. It won Splooshy Awards. It won all of Katie's Splooshes. And I'm going to keep doing it until someone emails email or tweets us and says thank you so much for introducing this show to me please don't watch the english dub on hbo max thank you <laughs> um if you want to see us in a non-subtitle capacity on twitter and instagram we're at for your fpod write us an email at hello at fypodcast.com also remember that ot recommended this film so if you have any complaints please forward it to our emails mm-hmm. we're also on rock hard rottweiler dicks So leave a rating or review. See ya. Amen.